Hi, my name is Andrew Ivana, and for my final project in the history of photojournalism, I will be talking about David Guttenfelder. Now, you may ask, who is David Guttenfelder, and why is he so important? And, well, I have an answer for you. David Guttenfelder is a U.S.-born photographer who graduated from the University of Iowa with a bachelor's degree in cultural anthropology, African studies, as well as journalism. For the last 20 years, he has been working at National Geographic, as well as the Associated Press, and his pictures can be seen online on the National Geographic website, as well as various media outlets, and also on his personal Instagram account. As we talked about motivation earlier in the class, everyone has a different motivation to doing something. What motivates us? That's a wonderful question. And it's a question that is so simple, yet is so difficult to answer. Now, Guttenfelder in particular focuses his work on geopolitical conflict, conservation, and culture. And he attributes much of his motivations to the ability to show the rest of the world what's going on in places such as North Korea, a place that not many people from outside North Korea have seen. And, you know, Guttenfelder having the ability to capture these moments, these events, these stories that no one is knowing about is truly amazing. In an interview with Wired Magazine, he is quoted to say, in a country known for its censorship, I'm now uploading photos to Instagram from the streets of North Korea like I would anywhere else in the world. Through social media, I'm trying to piece together a picture of this country for the outside world. No one puts their hands in front of my camera and no one tells me not to shoot things. There's no review process. They don't look at my pictures at all before I send them on to the Associated Press Wire or on my Instagram account. Facebook even asks me to tag my friends, Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung, when I upload my photos. One of the most intriguing and interesting, and I think it really speaks a lot to this generation, is that Guttenfelder uses an iPhone and posts his images to Instagram. The way I actually found Guttenfelder was through Instagram when I was scrolling through uh probably about two or three years ago um, through my Discover page and some of his images popped up and I took a look at his work and I was thought, wow, what a great follow. So, I mean, ever since, and I didn't even realize that, you know, I made that connection with photojournalism two years ago, but now I'm looking back at it and, you know, really t thinking and, you know, bringing the ideas of like the impacts and the use of technology and you know the development of photojournalism it, it really speaks volumes that you know a simple app like Instagram has brought you know me someone who not really is very big into f taking pictures and you know I mean I really like looking at them but I don't really know the science behind them the work behind them but Guttenfelder has almost personalized it, you know, brought it down to that consumer level. And he actually won Instagram user of the year by Time Magazine in 2014. And he was interviewed by The Sixth Floor, which is, I guess, a New York Times article about his use of the iPhone and how he uses it as a second camera. And he was asked, is the iPhone a legitimate camera? And his answer to that was, yes, it is, and increasingly more so. The iPhone has become an additional camera for me for a long time now. It's something I use to add what I'm ar to what I'm already doing with my so-called real cameras. It owns a creative space for me, and I think we're getting so used to using a smartphone as a camera that we start thinking about the limitations of real cameras now. I wish I could open the back of my Canon and process and publish immediately. I wish I could listen to music on my Canon camera while taking pictures. Eventually, there will be sort of a merging with cameras we use that we call our real cameras and the camera phones that we use for fun or extra creativity. I think that will all become one. That's going to work. That's going to change the way we work. 
and you know it really I think it speaks volumes to how good you know cell phone cameras have become you know being able to have something so capable I mean right now I'm shooting on an iPhone 6 using the front camera and I mean if it, it's not the best picture but it, it does the job and in a pinch it'll take the image way faster than any point and shoot camera I mean it literally fits in the back of your pocket not many cameras you can say that about regardless of how old they are what generation they were from so his use with cell phones and Instagram like on the side for additional work it is really truly stunning and I thought that totally really captivated what I find interesting about him now you might ask you know how has this photojournalist you know how is he viewed by other people how, like, how how do people judge his work you know do people enjoy looking at his work and I would say just by his Instagram numbers alone that you know it, it's striking how you know a simple app or you know an article on you know North Korea or you know he's doing something such as the everyday USA project on Instagram which I'll link more to in my blog you know it shows just just from the sh like the sheer numbers that he has over now a hundred thousand followers on Instagram you know that's a hundred thousand people I mean that might not sound like a lot of people in the US but you know that number is growing you know that number is growing every single day it, it really shows a testament of you know his, his great work I mean he's been the Instagram photographer of the year named by Time magazine and he's won a shorty award in for online photography in 2013 he's been on panel lectures he's spoken I mean he's well versed you know in today's world of photojournalism and I think that's what makes him really interesting because he really I think I think he he utilizes all the aspects of what a modern day photojournalist you know is you know one guy with a DSLR camera here and then you know on the other hand you know he's got the iPhone it it really shows that he's you know well versed in both aspects and I think his his work definitely shows so over the next few minutes I will be showing you you know some of the work that I find really interesting and you know stuff that I find that you know really captures what I think his you know his career really portrays you know some of his work in Afghanistan some of his work within the US that I haven't talked about much you know his work in North Korea of course you know and and some more you know I really think that he has some amazing work so I hope I can kind of show as much as I can, as fast as I can, and talk about all, all of them. So sit back, relax, and uh, enjoy. Now, if you take a look here at the image that I'm going to be showing you, it's a man sitting on a New York Street corner holding a sign that says, Seeking Human Kindness. And the structure of this picture is, you know, interesting. It makes you think, you know, what is human kindness? And how can we find it? You know, Guttenfelder has this has this very keen eye on, you know, trying to find, you know, beauty within anything. You know, his his images are clearly a testament of that. You know, he uses black and white in this picture, and I think it really brings out the life of this picture. It, it really helps, I mean, I think it helps tell the, to tell the tale of, you know, this homeless guy, you know, sitting on one of the many street corners of New York City, you know, just looking to see, you know, a change in the world, you know, a change of his day, you know, he's got, I'm sure he's got a lot worse conditions than, than many of us do, and it's sad, but, 
you know, it's the reality of the world that we live in, you know, in America. You know, he he uses shadows as well. I mean, you can see right behind him the trash bin. You know, it, you, make, you make yourself think, like, is it about, you know, is it noon? Is he hungry? You know, is that man hungry? Is it, you know, getting to be 5 o'clock? You know, is, is it dinner time? You know, those are the things that kind of I, I think of when I look at this picture. And, you know, you see the woman's feet in the crosswalk. You know, it doesn't look like she really stopped and, you know, maybe struck up a conversation with the person. A lot of people don't. I mean, I've been... Like, I've been in that situation where, you know, these people are holding signs saying, you know, combat veteran, you know, please help. And, I mean, I wish I could, but, I mean, I look at myself and, I mean, I'm a senior in college. I have hardly any money to put gas in my tank right now, let alone, you know, give it away. And I feel so deeply sorry about it. And, you know, once I have the opportunity to actually help people, I'd like to. So, you know, that's the kind of dialogue that I think is brought up from this picture. So, yeah, think about it. Now, the second picture that I'm going to be showing you is actually from his work in North Korea. Pictured in the center is... Dennis Rodman. Now, Dennis Rodman was an NBA player that played on the Bulls and a few other teams in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, he's become sort of a public icon because he he's so ridiculous in some of the things that he does. And one of the things that, you know, he did was go out to North Korea and apparently hung out with Kim Jong-un. The dictator of North Korea and you know their friends so so called but I mean right here you can see that he's you know meeting these North Korean basketball players and you know he's wearing this pink jacket with a scarf and I mean he's, he's always been an eccentric person um, I mean you can do a quick Google search of Dennis Rodman and you will see that he's a pretty eccentric person now this picture seems to be taken with an iPhone, and you can tell, I mean, the quality of the picture is not that great, but I don't think it's the quality of the picture, I think it's the content that really, uh, you know, brings out this, you know, this idea, you know, he uses Dennis Rodman as a focal point in the center of the picture, you know, he has this crazy, you know, outfit on while he's talking to all these North Korean basketball players, many of who are a lot smaller, and they're definitely not black. I mean, you know, race isn't much of an idea, but I mean, when he's probably the only black person in North Korea, he kind of stands out like a sore thumb, and I think it's kind of funny. Um, you know, you can see all of the basketball players, they have a smile on their face, and, you know, these are the most privileged, these are some of the most privileged people in North Korea. I mean, if you do a quick search on North Korea or you, you watch a quick documentary in North Korea, you'll know that, you know, many people's lives are, are shaped and formed by what the government tells them. You know, a lot of people live in poverty. A lot of people, you know, don't have, you know, money for food. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. And that's a reality for a lot of people in North Korea. So, you know, it, it really, you know, you know it, it hurts me to know that there's people living out there with poverty, but, you know, these people here, you know, they're privileged. You can see that, you know. Also, you know, this, the basketball court, you know, it, it looks lavish. You know, you can see the tile floor, and you can see the wood tile flooring, you know. These people are playing the game, you know, on a, on a well, it looks like a pretty well-built, you know, arena. You know, it has major seating, you know, a lot of people can probably go. So it, it, it really, you know, it, it looks almost to me like there's a facade going on, you know, in North Korea, you know, trying to show the world that, you know, it's not so bad of a place after all, but they don't know, you know, the untrue 
things that are going on within the country. So I thought it was pretty interesting, and, you know, I was reading back a few years ago when Dennis Rodman went down to North Korea that he was hanging out with Kim Jong-un and, you know, making all these appearances, you know, to this basketball practice, this basketball game, whatever it was, um, to be pretty interesting. Also, side note, you know, these men, you know, they're it looks like they're professional basketball players, and, you know, you take a look at their shoes. You know, the man that's shaking Dennis Rodman's hand is, is wearing a pair of ASIC shoes that look pretty beat up. So that that makes me think, you know, do they have access to the shoes that we do? You know, do they have the, the Nike shoes, the, the top-of-the-line stuff, you know, within society? Can these people afford it? You know, I, I'm wondering my, to myself, you know, how much are these people making if they're basketball players? So it's... It's striking, and it, I mean, it makes me think, and I mean, I hope it makes you think as well. This third image that I'm going to be talking about is another from Guttenfelder's work in North Korea. And if you think to yourself, you know, when do I think this picture was taken? And if I didn't know when it was taken, I would say it, it looks to be taken, you know, in the 70s or in the 80s, you know, even the 90s. I mean... You look at the, the uniforms that these runners are wearing and, you know, the outfits that the people in the military suits are wearing, you know. It looks like something, like, straight out of, you know, a past time. But in reality, this picture was taken in 2013 at Kim Il-sung Stadium in Pyongyang, you know. Excuse me if I pronounce it wrong, um, but it, it really, it strikes me, you know, if you look at the texture of the wall behind, you know, you can see that it, it doesn't look, it doesn't look great. The architecture just doesn't look very strong, and, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting to see because, you know, we have all of these, you know, beautiful stadiums and arenas and, and, and venues in the United States. I mean, even... Like, say, Fenway Park, it's one of the oldest places, you know, that still operates for baseball games. But it looks brand new on the inside in some aspects. I mean, I understand that, you know, they've had renovations and everything. But, you know, the brick, you know, it, it, it's truly an amazing structure. And this structure here, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't capture me and tell me that, like, it really, it really is, a, I don't know, a great work of architecture. Um... You know, these people in front, the three runners, you know, you can see the emotions on their face. You know, they look like they're very tired, you know. They just finished a marathon. Obviously, they're going to be tired, but, you know, if you look also in the back, you know, all the people on the stands, you know, if you look at their emotions, if you can look, you know, kind of at everyone's eyes, you know, they all have, like, a grim and dreary look, you know, it, it doesn't look like they really want to be there, and it makes me think, like, do these people have to be there, were they forced to be there at this event, um, it's really, it makes me think, and I mean, I hope it makes you think, you know, the contrast of it, I mean, too, you look at their, the three runners' uniforms, they're, the red, blue, I mean, excuse me, green, white, and blue, and just those look like the most colorful things in the whole picture. I mean, I think everyone in the stands, I mean, I'm looking at everyone in the stands, and I don't see anyone that's wearing a different color other than gray or black or or that dark hunter green. It's interesting. So give it some thought. So this fourth and final image that I'm going to be posting in this video captures a farmer tilling his field with what looks like hay, um, you know, kind of representing, I feel like, what like the heart of America really is. I mean, if you, if you boil it down to the bottom of the economic, you know, thing, farming is a huge and fundamental part of America, and a lot of the people... In the Midwest, this picture was taken in Wisconsin in 2013, you know, rely on their crops. You know, they rely on their farm equipment. And, you know, I think it really captures a great time. You know, it, it captures, you know, a hardworking American. 
you know, trying to make his, like, make his, his end, of, like, his, his money. So, interesting picture. I mean, the depth of field is really, is really stunning. I mean, you can see this huge background, you know, of his field, you know, and then right in, in the front and center is this man, you know, on what looks to be a small tractor. But, I mean, you take a look at the man, you take a look at the size of the tires that are on the machine, and you say, wow, like, that's actually a really big field around him. You know, the use of lines also, you know, those diagonal lines, the horizontal lines, you know, the backdrop, you know, it, it really, you know, it's an amazing piece of art. I mean, it's, it looks like an amazing piece of land. So it really, I mean, it captivates me. I mean, I, I, I think farming is a really wonderful thing. And it's a dying thing. I mean, not a lot of people are going into farming these days. And the people that are in farming, you know, they're hardworking individuals, that blue collar feel. So interesting. And I mean, a lot of Guttenfelder's work is, is done in black and white. And I find it really, really interesting because I think, like I said, you know, with the homeless person in New York City, you know, it really, it really gives a different idea of what's going on in the picture. It really, you know, if this picture is taken in color, I mean, I might not, I might not think twice about looking at it, you know, I might say, oh, it's just a guy farming around a field, but, you know, putting it in black and white, showcasing it in black and white, you know, it really makes me think, you know, it makes me think, how old is that, is that tractor? I mean, how big are those, are those hay bales, you know, what's he doing, you know, it's just, it's interesting, so, I don't know, you gotta think, and, you know, I say I don't know, because, you know, I'm thinking more and more about the, about this image, and it, it's just creating more thoughts, you know, as I, as I speak more and more about it, it just, it brings up more ideas, you know, look at the clouds in the sky, you know, what day is it, what time, of, what time of the year is it, you know, is it fall, is it that late harvest, that second harvest of the year, it's interesting. Lastly, I just want to talk about, you know, Guttenfelder as a person, one final time, you know, I'm going to show this picture of him, you know, with bison in the background, you know, he's, he's on call, he's, he's taking a picture, I mean, he's in the 21st century, he's taking a selfie with his iPhone, I mean, you can't get, you know, more of, you know, this person's from the 20, like the 2010s, you know, this person's not a person of the past, this person's living in the present, he's, he's thinking about the future, you know, Guttenfelder, I think, has has made quite an impact on the world, you know, especially in the world of photography itself. You know, it really, it really is an interesting thing, and I mean, I, I think he's doing a great service to the world of photojournalism. So, I apologize for how long this video has become, but it really, you know, it's been fun to make, and it, it really, you know, it's made me think about more of people today as photojournalists, and, you know, people that really succeed in the world of photojournalism and I feel like Guttenfelder is you know probably one of the best if not the best photojournalist of our time so but yeah food for thought and you know it, it just just looking at his pictures making me want to go out you know and try out a black and white black and white filter he uses black and white in a lot of his pictures and I mean I think it really adds a lot of character to them so